Our scripture comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, we also have joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Isn't that a fantastic text in Romans? The whole plan of salvation right there. Every single aspect of the plan of salvation in 11 verses. I've titled this sermon, Consuming Fire. Because our God is a consuming fire. But what does he consume? Yes, you're right. He is a sin-consuming God. And it is our choice whether we wish to cling to sin or relinquish sin. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by faith alone that we find access to heaven, not by works, lest any of us should boast, because then it would be wages, right? And wages are not a gift, they're an obligation. And here we have these great promises, and not only so, we read there in verse 11 at the end, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So the entire aspect of redemption in Christ, atonement for our sins, all of these aspects are in this text. And I would say that the evangelical world seems to subscribe to everything this text stands for. And yet, the evangelical world denies the character of God as expounded in this text. That this God of love is not a God who took into account our weaknesses and our rebellion, but while we were yet in rebellion, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So this is an amazing revelation of the love of God and the kindness of God and the character of God. But I would like to suggest that the very Christian world that embraces these truths perform a character assassination on Jesus Christ. 
And it is our duty as Seventh-day Adventists to set this record straight. We, as a people, should be foremost in setting the, the record straight on the character of God. Now, this is not a full frontal attack on evangelicals or on any Christian denomination out there because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that includes me as well. I must also have been a sinner when Christ died for me. Is that not correct? So this is not a question of superiority, but when God reveals himself and he reveals his character unto us, that is when we not only embrace salvation, but we also take upon ourselves the obligation of setting right in the world a character that has been distorted by false doctrines. Wouldn't you say that that is an important thing that we have to do? So what is our duty as Seventh-day Adventists? Isaiah chapter 58 verse 12 tells us, And they that shall be of thee, the remnant, shall build the old waste places and shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now, what foundation do we have to raise up? Well, let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there is a foundation that needs to be raised up. That's a foundation that has been discarded. That's a foundation that has become a stumbling block. That is a foundation that lies in the dust of false doctrine, defacing, distorting the character of God. I was an atheist, full-blown atheist probably one of the youngest atheists ever to be raised in a Christian home. And why was I an atheist? Why was I a full-blown atheist by the age of 10? And why was I in rebellion against God from the age of 8? Because of doctrine. Because of doctrine. Because being raised in Roman Catholicism, I was told that my mother would be sent to hell for all eternity because she was a Protestant. That was before Vatican II, of course. That dates me and ages me, but that's all right. So here was a doctrine that showed God in a wrathful light. One who was prepared torture forever and ever someone who was to me at that stage when I was eight years old the beginning and the end of everything that I knew. So doctrine can make people atheists. And I believe there are millions of atheists out there because of doctrine. Psalms 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Isaiah 28, verse 16, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, if he was rejected in the past, 
Is it possible that in a world that embraces Jesus Christ the way that it supposedly does, I mean, currently it is the Christmas season and the world seems bent on embracing him, though they seem more interested in uh, Santa Claus, who is a figment of the imagination, than they are in Christianity. But nevertheless, there's lip service, isn't there? And this Jesus Christ is rejected. As verily as when he was rejected by the Jews in the time of Christ. Just in another form. They don't want this Jesus. They want another Jesus. They want a national deliverer rather than a deliverer from sin. Or they want a deliverer only for certain groups and not for others. They want a selective deliverer. And that is not in conformity with the gospel of love which embraces the whole of mankind. So the character of Jesus Christ lies shattered and scattered on the highways of this planet, trampled in the dust by every wind of doctrine. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, should know the doctrine. Take heed of the doctrine. Because these doctrines deface the character of God. And I want to go through a few of them, not to attack any church group out there, but to set right the record on the character of God. So the motive is totally different. Roman Catholicism reduces Jesus to a helpless babe on the knee of his mother. Or it reduces him to a perpetual corpse on a cross. And you worship before a crucifix. Or even worse, it reduces him to a corpus Christi, which is a wafer of the body of Christ. So he's either hanging on a cross, on a crucifix, or he's a morsel of bread, a dead corpse in a morsel of bread, or he's a helpless babe on a knee. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception robs him of his salvation for all entity. And it also robs him of his coming in humanity and reaching man where he is. Being the only mediator between man and God because now we have interposed another mediator. If ever Roman Catholicism allows for an adult Jesus Christ, he's always wrathful and needs a wrath subduer. He's always willing to throw you either into hell if there is not an intercession from a saint or from Mary, or he's willing to roast you in purgatory. And that's the image of Jesus that is presented in Catholicism. It's a sad image. It's, it's a Jesus you would want to run away from and rather run to the mother than run to Jesus. So the doctrines as espoused in Catholicism make of none effect the beauty, the humbleness, the kindness of God in Christ. Now, Protestants pride themselves that they have performed a much better job. They've thrown out purgatory. Have they thrown out hell? No, they have not thrown it out. 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God, not he, God, was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. 
We know that the new translations divest the godhood out of that text, which is rather sad because then they are totally nonsensical. But we need to stand up for the character of God. Because of the Roman Catholic view of Jesus Christ, I and many like me were atheists. And if I look at uh, some of the statements by the scientists, the top scientists in the world out there, who also deny Christianity and Christ, it seems to me that their main problem is very similar to mine. It's the character of God that's at stake. Nobody wants to serve a God like that. Then there are twin errors which deface the character of God, which seem to be universal to almost the entire Christian world. The twin doctrines of immortality, of the soul, and Sunday sacredness. Those two doctrines. Both of them rob Jesus Christ of his omnipotence and his power and his atonement. Logically speaking, if man is immortal in terms of his soul, when he dies, he remains alive in an altered state of consciousness, if you like, then the plan of salvation and the atonement is made to naught. Because why would Jesus Christ die to give us eternal life if we haven't lost it in the first place? Does that make sense? Why would Jesus have to die if I am immortal? Irrespective of the fact that it is in another state, in a spirit world or whatever realm we are being told it is in, it doesn't matter in which state I remain immortal, it makes of none effect the atonement. Null and void. Jesus died for nothing. So what was the suffering for? In Roman Catholicism, we celebrate it as the passion of Christ and we go through the stations of the cross and we celebrate the suffering. Is that what we are supposed to celebrate when we celebrate our salvation in Jesus Christ? Or is it the fact that his death overcame sin and made it possible for me who was dead in transgression to have eternal life. So with the doctrine of immortality comes a whole package of defacing characteristics which relegate Jesus Christ to the trash heap of history. He died for absolutely nothing. The transference of the Sabbath robs Jesus of his authority and gives his authority to someone else, to an earthly power that calls the shots. So Jesus has become toothless. His atonement and his death is just a sympathy raiser. Poor man, look how he suffered for us. Unnecessarily, because we have eternal life, we're immortal. The whole of Christianity shatters on this point. There is no point in believing in the plan of salvation if these issues of immortality and Sunday sacredness are true. God is impotent, he's not omnipotent, and he has no authority, not even in his own law. So they rob Christ of divinity, omnipotence, as verily as when you deny his divinity directly, as some do. Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam, any one of the religions that deny the divinity of Christ in a non-pantheistic sense, sense, we might as well deny it like that. We read in the great controversy these statements. 
through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation for spiritualism, the latter create, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. And we see it in the world today. This triune union of the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, which incorporates the religious components of Catholicism, Protestantism that embraces these doctrinal errors, and spiritualism, is rampant today. We have all of these in the churches with spiritual formation, apparitions, contemplative prayer, all of these things, spiritualism taking the place of the reality of faith. Every single Christian world church out there today has drunk of the doctrine of hell. Every single one of them. Some of them are offended if you don't want to believe that God will relegate people for a short life of insurrection to an eternity of suffering in the most horrendous fires. And we've seen books come out of late on heaven and on hell, visions where Jesus is walking around a boiling cauldron with people boiling, sadly shaking his head because he's totally impotent to do something about it. What kind of a God would do things like that? What mother or which father would take his child and chuck him into a boiling cauldron and boil him alive forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Is that a God to be loved? No wonder in the movie Zeitgeist they show how he punishes you and puts you to death and puts you into hell and burns you. And then they joke about it and say, but he loves you. And then they laugh like drains. This is a terrible picture in the world out there of Jesus Christ. I read also, where in the pages of God's word is such teaching to be found? If we are not prepared to look at the meanings of the words and the context of the words and the parallelisms in the word that explain this doctrine of fire, consuming fire, then we will get a picture of God that is so distorted that this God is anything but lovable. Where in the pages of God's word is such teachings to be found? Will the redeemed in heaven be lost to all emotions of pity and compassion and even to feelings of common humanity? Are these to be exchanged for the indifference of the stoic or the cruelty of the savage? No, no, such is not the teaching of the book of God. The theory of eternal torment is one of the false doctrines that constitute the wine of the abominations of Babylon. When we consider in what false colors Satan has painted the character of God, can we wonder that our merciful, merciful creator is feared and even hated? The principles of kindness, mercy, love, taught and exemplified by our Savior, are a transcript of the will and character of God. God executes justice upon the wicked for the good of the universe and even for the good of those upon whom his judgment is visited. Our God is a consuming fire. He pleads with us to let go of our sin. If we refuse to let go of it and cling to it, we are consumed with it. And we will be ashes under the feet of those who have given up the sin. If you've given up sin, you will stand like the worthy friends of Daniel in the fire without being consumed. All right, those are direct doctrines that deface the character of God. Let's take a few other 
pet doctrines in the world out there and ask ourselves, what do these doctrines do to the character of God? Remember, take heed to the doctrine. Because the doctrine teaches you about the character of God. And if I lay doctrine aside, I can end up with the soup of love and hate in the same deity. Indifference. Let's look at the doctrine of predestination. This is an incredible doctrine. Predestination teaches that certain people in the world, and this is the entire Calvinistic world, it's in their creed. It's probably one of the largest portions of the Protestant world that subscribes to this doctrine. Even underlining and signing the articles of doctrine which says that man is so fallen that he cannot make a choice. Therefore, God makes the choice for him. And if you are predestined for heaven, then you fall under irresistible grace. You will be saved whether you want to or not. You cannot resist the grace. And if you are destined to hell, well, then you must still praise God. And this gets kind of weird because the difference between damnation and glorification is only apparent because of the suffering in the hell when compared to the glory of heaven. If you only have glory, you have nothing to compare it with. So the hell is there to the glory of the glorified. Whew. Do you want to serve that God? I don't want to. I don't want to serve a God like that. That will make some people by arbitrary choice suffer so that the glory up there should be so great. What if? Just what if? He chose to let my daughter or my son suffer down there so that my glory up there by comparison should not fade. Could I love that God for all eternity as I look into the fires of hell? Could I love him? I don't think I could love him. I think I would despise him. I think I would despise him and there'd be another rebellion in heaven. And yet this is what the Christian world believes. What kind of God is this? What kind of God is this? And once you get to the doctrine of predestination, well, then anything goes. Then you can have salvation by lineage. I can define that a whole nation has been predestined to be saved. And therefore, all I have to do in order to be saved is to be fortunate enough to have been born in that nation. And we have many such nations who make that claim. They all want to be Israel's descendants. And all Israel will be saved, predestination, and all the rest are going to be lost. Well, if everybody else is going to be lost, I better make sure I'm Israel. And so I define myself as Israel. And it's easy because ten tribes apparently went lost, although there's no record of them ever moving out of their occupied areas as a nation to occupy Europe or elsewhere. And yet these are the doctrines largely of Protestant America, Protestant Britain, large portions of Protestant Europe, their descendants, Protestant Southern Africa, their descendants in the Pacific. And they believe it with fervor and will defend it and the next point in the doctrine would be, well, if we are predestined to be saved and those are predestined to go to hell, well, then we might as well trample upon them now because they're nothing better than garbage. And then you develop doctrines like racial superiority, 
ethnic cleansing, and all of these issues that go along with it, because it doesn't make any difference anyway. And if you are warped enough in this thinking, you might even go so far as to identify everything that is not you as even non-human and therefore dispensable. Do we have it in the world? Yes or no? Yes. In my own country, the entire apartheid regime was based on the doctrine of predestination. It was preached in the churches and made a pivot and a pillar of the political system. What does that do to the character of God? It makes him arbitrary. Arbitrary. You're saved, you're lost. For no other reason than I think so. I want it that way. It's not what my Bible teaches. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 7, So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel, therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. It's not talking about death now, it's talking about eternal death. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his ways, and he does not turn from his ways, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. Therefore, you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if your transgressions and your sins lie upon you, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I've been to so many funerals where they preach, it pleased God <laughs> to take our brother and our sister, whatever. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why would you die, O house of Israel? Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous man, reverse coin, shall not deliver him the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. Does this sound like an arbitrary choice that God makes? Or does it sound like we have a role to play in that choice? Surely we have a role to play then why does such a large proportion of the church believe this? When I say to the righteous, he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Eternal death. That's what it's talking about. Not earthly death here and spiritual existence further. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right. If the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. My favorite word in the Bible is whosoever, whosoever, whosoever turns to him will be saved. Whosoever believes in him will be saved. There is no question about predestination anywhere in the word of God unless you willingly want to distort it to meet some selfish end of superiority. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day 
that I have set, ye, set before thee life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that thou mayst live, thou and thy seed. This sets the character of God right. This is a God who stands for righteousness, who stands for judgment, who is no wimp. Joshua 24, 15 says, And if it seems evil unto you to serve Jehovah, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. John 15, verse 16 says, Ye did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He says, I chose you, but how many did he choose? All. Every single one. Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to you, would not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If we as a people of the book do not stand up and say, but this doctrine is wrong. Now, this is the amazing thing about the subtleties of Satan. Let's say a large portion, whatever that percentage is, has a Calvinistic view of predestination amongst Christianity. And the other portion of Protestant Christianity says, no, that is not correct. I mean, that, that's a fact. Uh, the evangelical world doesn't believe in predestination, does it? Does it? Not officially, no. But they believe it as verily as though they'd actually signed it. Because they take other doctrines and add them and distort them to the point where they might as well believe the same thing. God is not arbitrary. We read in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, the Father sets his love upon his elect people who live in the midst of men. These are the people whom Christ has redeemed by the price of his own blood and because they respond to the drawing of Christ through the sovereign mercy of God, they are elected to be saved as his obedient children. Upon them is manifested the free grace of God, the love wherewith he has loved them. Everyone who will humble himself as a little child, who will receive and obey the word of God with a child's simplicity will be among the elect of God. Isn't that nice? Everyone. So when we read in Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. So you take that text out of context and you end up with predestination. When the God of heaven had Saul anointed king of Israel. The Bible says because he was humble, he was elected. Now my question is this, did God know that Saul was going to apostatize later on, yes or no? Of course he knew it. Of course he knew it. And if I had been God... Would I have elected him in the first place? Yes or no? No. I wouldn't have elected him. I would have chosen someone better. Did God know that David was going to murder Uriah so that he could have his wife? Yes, I think he knew that too. So we have two situations here. God knew both cases. He knew both cases. But this is God. And I like that about God. He didn't hold his foreknowledge 
against Saul. He took Saul in the circumstances in which he was, and he anointed him king. He was deserving, and he was humble. God knew he would go astray later on, and he didn't hold that foreknowledge against him. And then you look at the story of David and how David reacted, and you learn something about the character of God. God knew that too, and yet he anointed him king. And the one will be saved and the other one will be lost. Although what David did wasn't worse than what Saul did. Or wasn't less bad either. Isn't that so? Probably worse, maybe even. Saul experienced the repentance of loss. He felt sorry for what he had lost. And David experienced the heart repentance and sorrow for sin. And David was forgiven and will have eternal life. And Saul could not be forgiven because he never repented of the sin. He only repented of the consequences of his deeds and felt sorrow for those and he will be lost. So God's character is so incredibly fair that he at no stage uses his foreknowledge to condemn anyone beforehand or afterward. The gospel, what a treasure house of knowledge. It is not as a pool that evaporates. Not as a broken cistern that loses its treasure, leaving mud and decaying vegetation behind. Not as a fountain that once sent forth a living, refreshing, cooling stream but has ceased to send forth its cooling waters. Your life may be a living spring that leaps from rock to rock, clear and sparkling with life, refreshing the weary, the thirsty, the heavy laden. These promises are not made to a few, but to all who will come to the heavenly banquet that God has prepared in sending his Son to our world to die on our behalf that through faith in him we should become one with God. Everyone is invited. Everyone is invited. And God will honor your decision where it is, irrespective of what you will do in the future or what you did in the past. We have this freedom of choice. Wonderful possibilities are provided for everyone who has faith in Christ. No walls are built to keep any living soul from salvation. The predestination or election of which God speaks includes all who will accept Christ as a personal Savior, who will return to their loyalty to perfect obedience to all God's commandments. This is the effectual salvation of a peculiar people chosen by God from amongst men. And all who are willing to be saved by Christ are the elect of God. So we read in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, An apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God to the saints that are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. These texts only become clear in the light of all the other texts which put the issue beyond doubt, like the texts in Ezekiel in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now let's look at one other doctrine that is not clearly predestination, but is very similar, although it isn't perceived as such. And the sad thing is that probably 96% of Christendom believes this today. Dispensationalism. 
dispensationalism. The bulk of Christianity today teaches dispensationalism. And then there are offshoots of dispensationalism. Futurism is one of them. It's a dispensationalist doctrine. What does this do to the character of God? We need to think about this. In dispensationalism, God, in different ages, has different dispensations. And salvation is determined differently in each one of those dispensations. And so you have a dispensation, for example, of law, where you had to keep the law. If, the broke the, if you broke the law, you went straight to the hot place, you didn't pass go, and you didn't collect 200 bucks. Gone. And then you come to the dispensation of grace after the cross. And now you don't have to keep the law because you are under grace and you are no longer under law. And then you'll come to the dispensation of the kingdom which has nothing to do with Christianity at all because prior to the dispensation of the kingdom the Christian church will be raptured. Isn't that right? All right. Now, if you were a Jew that had fallen under the dispensation of law, and in the judgment you come before God, and you had done whatever, committed adultery, stolen something, whatever, you're judged by that. That's your criterion. And here is someone else, and he's in heaven who did exactly the same thing, but he fell under the dispensation of grace. What would you say to God? Excuse me. Uh, uh, in my defense, I would like to ask a question. Uh, are we not applying double standards here? Would you say that? Aren't these double standards? One set of criteria and norms for one age another set of criteria and norms for another age. And the exciting thing is, the Jews who fall under the dispensation of the kingdom all get a second chance doctrine, second chance to accept Jesus Christ, and eventually all do, according to the doctrine. Isn't that right? Now, if I was a Jew, living there in the past, I would say, excuse me, could you please explain this? Or if I was a Christian, I'm lost over here because I did whatever I did. But right at the end, everybody will be saved and get a second chance. So the people at the end of time have two chances, but here down the line in the past, they had one chance. One choice. Uh, what would that do to you in terms of your estimation of the fairness of God. Isn't that pathetic? Would you like to be brought before a judge like that? With different criteria? Well, if he has different criteria for different ages, maybe he has different criteria for different sexes, or different races, or different whatever. There's no standard, there's no fixed marker, there's nothing. So isn't this sort of almost like a predestination as well? If you get a second chance doctrine at the end and everyone will be converted, isn't that a predestination? 96% of the Christian world believes that, although more than half of that 96% 96% denies predestination, but they accept it in another form. It's exactly the same thing. Either God is fair or he's not fair. Either there's justice or there is no justice. Who's going to stand up for Jesus and say, oh, hang on a second, my God doesn't change. Jesus Christ has the same criteria then and now and forever. He's fair. 
He's just. Of course, I don't even want to go into grace and law because that's all part of this dispensationalism. We've already said it at nausea. You cannot be under grace if there is no law because without law there's no transgression and if there's no transgression without the law then I don't need any grace because I only need grace if I'm a transgressor, right? So grace without law, predestination, dispensation, what do they do to the character of God? They make him arbitrary. They turn him into a monster. And then, if you think about it a little bit further, the doctrine of predestination that has been manipulated into dispensation and eventually ends up in futurism where everything happens in the future and the entire Bible is geared to futurism and what happens right at the end after the secret rapture. Isn't that what it's about? When is Antichrist coming according to that doctrine? After the rapture, isn't that right? So it doesn't affect Christianity at all got nothing to do with Christians. It has to do with future events that pertain to the Jews who rejected Christ then, but somehow miraculously will accept him later, being irresistibly drawn. And all the prophecies in the Bible and everything that is written in this book pertains to a time when the Christians aren't even on the planet, and this is called the Christian Bible. I don't want to be funny now, but does that make any sense? And all the Christians who've lived through all the ages, studying their Bibles to see the times we are looking in, living in, what did they do? Wasted their time. Wasted their time. What's the point of studying the Bible? It doesn't affect you. And Jesus was wasting his time when he said, our Father who art in heaven, this is how you must pray, hallowed be thy name. Thy, excuse me, the kingdom has nothing to do with you. The kingdom is for the Jews. And Christ becomes a bigamist because he has two wives, one bride, the Christian church, which stays in heaven, while he sits on the throne of his other bride, which is here on earth. And the whole doctrine of Christianity shatters right there and goes down the drain. And the whole question of prophecy and the word of God does not pertain to me at all. I might as well relegate it to the trash heap of mythology. It is true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features and assuming a Christian guise. But its utterances from the platform and the press have been before the public for nearly 40 years and in these its real character stand revealed. Even in its present form, so far from being more worthy of toleration than formerly, it is really more dangerous because of more subtle deception. While it formerly denounced Christ and the Bible, it now professes to accept both. But the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. While its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect, love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God. He becomes a sugar daddy who glosses over everything, died an impotent death. After all, we're immortal, so his death was of none effect. But it degrades it to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. God's justice 
his denunciation of sin, the requirements of his holy law, all are kept out of sight. The people are taught to regard the Decalogue as a dead letter. Pleasing, bewitching fables captivate the senses and lead men to reject the Bible as the foundation of their faith. Christ is as verily denied as before, but Satan has so blinded the eyes of the people that the deception is not discerned. That's the Christian world today. And if someone doesn't stand up and defend the character of God, then millions will be lost as a consequence. Jesus is not a wimp. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This is the kind of God that we have to show to the world. A God of justice a God of fairness, a God of love, a religion of logic and sense. Christianity is the only logical religion on the planet. It's the only logical one. There's no other logical religion. All other religions, for some arbitrary reason, you're suffering and wallowing in this mire called earth, trying to work your way to heaven while some God looks on and decides whether your effort was good enough or not. Christianity is the only religion which says why we're in such a mess and gives the absolute solution. Christianity teaches that disobedience cost you Eden. Therefore, obedience must be a prerequisite for entrance into Eden. But since we are dead between this point and that point, it requires redemption. It requires someone who has life to give that life. Christianity makes sense. It's a logical religion. Today we have a religion which says, only believe and you will be saved. Only believe. There are many whose religion consists in theory. To them, a happy emotion is godliness. They say, come to Jesus and believe in him. I sat once in a sermon, and the pastor probably for 30 minutes said only those words till I was nearly nuts. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. That was his entire sermon for about 30 minutes. You don't know where to sit anymore later on. They do not seek to make the sinner understand the true character of sin. He is not urged to search the scriptures on bended knees, that he may know what is truth, or to pray, that his eyes may be anointed with eye salve, that he may see the grace of Christ. When the lawyer came to Christ saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The Savior did not say, Believe, only believe. No. He said, what is written in the law? And he says, how readest thou? The lawyer answered, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And Christ said, thou hast answered right, this do. It's pretty straight. And thou shalt live. Here the false doctrine that man has nothing to do but believe is swept away. Eternal life is given to us on the condition that we obey the commandments of God. Then we have another strange doctrine in Christianity, which is believe by virtually all. It gets worse. And that's the doctrine of substitution without consequence. And we sing it. Jesus did it all, all to him my own. That's right. He did it all. He did pay it all. But what is this doctrine of substitution? 
Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Excuse me, you will say. Then I don't understand Christianity. God, is he violating his own law here? Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus paid the price for me? Yes or no? So he who is not guilty paid the price so that I could live. But this doctrine here says the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Hmm. I was in my country and I was doing a transaction on my farm and I was with a lawyer. And I'd never spoken religion to this lawyer before. It was a normal land deal. You have to go to a lawyer, right? It's a normal land deal. Buying a farm, selling a farm, whatever. You have to go to a lawyer. I went to the lawyer. And this lawyer is an intelligent man. I like him. Nice person. And we were there and we were discussing the two parties, you know, how this is going to work and who's going to buy what and whatever and whatever. It's a land transaction. And this lawyer kept looking at me. And when this whole transaction was finished, he said to me, when the other party left, he said, can I speak to you? I said, yes. He said, uh, uh, not here, too many ears. Can we, can we go into the back room? I, I said, uh, are you charging me or am I charging you? <laughs> he says, no, 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 no. This is just between you and me. This has nothing to do with anything else. So off we went. We went into the back room. And there we sat. And then he said to me, I grew up a Christian. And I loved God. And I love Christianity and I grew up in a Christian home. But I cannot be a Christian anymore. Now why did he ask me those questions? I didn't know him from a bar of soap. Amazing, eh? He had a, he had a religious question for his client. So I sat there and I said, what's your problem? He says, you know what happened to me? I was in, in court the other day. And there were two brothers who had viciously beaten and raped a young girl. And in the court, the elder brother said that he was alone responsible and he took the rap, consistently denying that his younger brother had anything to do with it, but all the testimonies pointed, there was the testimony of the girl, that the younger brother had partaken as much in the deed as the older brother. But there was no evidence except the one word against the other word. That was the only evidence that there was. And so after a long and arduous court case, the older brother went to jail for the deed. And the younger brother walked free. And he said, you know what? That's Christianity. And he's right, isn't he? He says, that's Christianity. He walked free. And my problem with that is there's no justice. That younger brother was as guilty as the older brother. He should be in jail for what he did. And so... I have to turn my back on Christianity. And I looked at him and I said, the reason why you're turning your back on Christianity is because you have a wrong understanding of Christianity. You don't understand Christianity. 
You understand the false concept of Christianity. You understand evangelical Christianity. And that distorts the plan of salvation. That's not Christianity. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, let me explain it to you. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I cannot have eternal life without Christ. Is Christ my older brother who takes the rap and sets me free? Then there is no justice. In a sense he does it, yes. But there's more. Colossians 3, 1 to 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Huh? 2 Timothy 2.11 It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. The doctrine, only believe and you will be saved, violates God's own law, which says that everyone must die for his own transgression. What God did for me, which no man can do, is he paid the price and having life within himself, he can give me that life on one condition only, that I die. Die to what? Die to self and die to sin. So I said to the lawyer, do I pay the price? <laughs> yes, I have to pay the price. I'm dead. I cannot live again. Only God can give me life. Without him, I am dead forever. But the condition for my salvation is that like that younger brother, I die for my transgression. And I am raised in Christ, another person, and my own mother won't recognize me. I'll be a different person. Is that right? Cheap grace defaces the character of God, reduces his atonement to a sugar daddy Christmas present. Whereas the true plan of salvation requires a total change of heart, but it cannot give me life, even if I have a new heart, even if I say, Lord, I'm sorry, I never wanted to do that. I don't ever want to do whatever I did again. Can't give me life, I'm dead. I can only live in Christ. So it doesn't take away one iota of Christ's sacrifice for me or my dependence upon him. But it does restore the justice of God in its completeness. Because I must pay a price. I must die to self. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 to 8 What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? 
I cannot understand how the Christian world can distort these verses to mean exactly the opposite. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. We also receive a death sentence from the judge. Not just the older brother. So God is not violating his own law in this atonement. But an atonement which justifies sin does injustice to the character of God. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Did you know that Islam points that same finger at Christianity? I used to speak to many Muslim people. They say, your religion is pathetic, they say to me. Your religion is meaningless. There's no justice in your religion. You go and you sin, you go on your knees, you say, forgive me, and you're forgiven, and off you go and you sin again, and there you carry on like that, and you have a sugar daddy God. Not us Muslims, you sin. <laughs> Off your hand. Sharia law. You pay the price. You steal again. There goes the other hand. Gets harder and harder to steal if you carry on like that. But there's justice. Christianity has no justice, they say. Ah, but Christianity has a God of love. And Christianity has justice. You're a thief? Die. Die? Die to self? Forever? Not just now. Forever? Turn, turn from your evil ways and live. For why would you? Die, O house of Israel. If someone doesn't set the record straight, if someone doesn't bring the law and justice and righteousness together, then we end up with what we have in the world today, a plethora of confusion that makes Christ either a monster or a wimp. Seventh-day Adventists have been called to set the record straight on a God of love who is not a wimp, who is a consuming fire. We write, that which is we read, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. By nature the heart is evil, and who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Job 14 verse 14. No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Quoting Romans 8, 7, Matthew 15, 19. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting the impossibility. 
There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian life is not a modification or an improvement. I love that. Change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. It's powerful stuff. You know, John Wesley used to think that he was saved because he was not as bad as other people on the planet. And I'm telling you, there are millions who believe that today. I'm not as bad as that. I'm not a thief. I'm not a murderer. I'm all right, Jack. And that is because we have a totally erroneous idea of what sin is. We have no understanding. We must ourselves suffer the ills of violated laws. Ah, isn't this powerful stuff? This cheap grace that the world is being sold today. Whew, if we die, we die for ourselves. It is not best to live for the future eternal life. And is it not best to live for the future eternal life and die in Christ? It is our duty to study the laws that govern our being and conform to them. Ignorance in these things is sin. We cannot do as we please with our bodies, for they are God's property. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. So if a true Christian has accepted salvation in Christ and he rebels against Christ's authority, what is that proof of? That he has never died to self. And if you do not die to self, then you are like that younger brother who is set free without paying a price. No. True Christianity says place everything, everything on the altar. The repentant believer who takes the steps required in conversion commemorates in his baptism the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He goes down into the water in the likeness of Christ's death and burial and is raised out of the water in the likeness of his resurrection. We saw that today, didn't we? Not to take up the old life of sin, but to live a new life in Christ Jesus. This is the beauty of the gospel. And only if you have all the components in a row can mercy and justice kiss each other at the cross? Or else you sit with a plethora of confusions. I want to end with a statement from the Great Controversy, page 595. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reform. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, and we've seen many of these doctrines now, as numerous and disconcordant as are the churches which they represent. The voice of the majority not one or all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or pre precept, we should demand a plain, thus says the Lord, in support. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads the people to look to bishops and pastors. And what do we then have? Nothing but confusion. A distorted picture of the character of God and a plan of salvation that lies shattered on the field of doctrine. May the God of heaven help us to be true representatives of the character of God. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. Because without him we would be nothing and we would be eternally lost. We would like to thank you, Lord, that you have a plan of salvation. Transgression leads to death. But thanks be to God that we may have eternal life in Christ Jesus who laid down his life that we may live. But he requires obedience because he's not only our Savior, he's our King. And thank you, Lord, for coming to live the law that we may have an example of what we can be as men and women in Christ. Help us to put these things together in such a fashion that we rightly represent you as a sin-hating God and a sinner-loving God. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to represent you in a world that is bent on distorting your character. And help us by your spirit and by your word to set the record straight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.